Hello, people. Good evening, uh, good folks of Iowa City and the environs of Iowa and probably the upper Midwest and all across America. Uh, we're on a, one of these cold winter nights. It's the 26th of February and uh, record cold this morning in a long, cold winter. But here tonight we have a really, uh, I don't know how you say that, a really cool person, a uh, good friend, um, to warm us up in all good ways uh, in the journey that we've been on in this long, lonely winter, whether it's uh, physiological, climatological, or any of the above, or fill in the blank. So this is uh, Chuck Miller, who is a great poet of Iowa City, but also this country, underappreciated in uh, one of the real beat poets. I don't know what else you'd say, uh, just a real person from the heart beat. And um, Chuck has been around the world and um, has taught in many places. Um, I met Chuck in a writer's workshop called the Homeless Writer's Workshop. So uh, I give you Chuck. How are you doing tonight, Chuck? Okay. So I'll start off with this poem. Uh, it has a title, uh, Packing Heat. Right. Right. And uh, it's for my Israeli friend, Igal. And uh, packing heat means, you know, going armed. So uh, the question is, should we arm ourselves or should we take a more peaceful point of view? So I was just sort of struggling thinking about this. See? Packing heat for a gal. From time to time in this violent society, it has occurred to you that you should get a gun. So many people holding, ready to blow each other away for this or that infraction, you feel almost naked without one. And the pigs, of course, armed to the teeth. Not that there isn't some sense in this idea, but you think maybe you're intransigent enough already, and although you've wised up some, there is still a core of anger and fear at your center from having to live this absurd life, nor does the absurdity come to an end. So you say to yourself, why not let go of such ideas and try to live naked? Rather, follow the old Buddhist and Taoist monks and hermits, Han Shan and old Ryo Kan, practice a life of non-interference. And if you catch your lunch one day without being able to mount some sort of armed defense, you've lived long enough already, and you can see it's not going to get any better. At least you can be glad you've never harmed anyone else. You remember discussing the issue once with your Israeli friend. The question had also occurred to him. He had no answer, seemed tentative and puzzled in an attempt to piece out some sense from it. What conclusion he came to, you don't know. Mm. But the governments of our respective societies, neither scaling back nor disarming, but constantly ramping up to brutalize their opponents. And in fact, your one Palestinian friend losing his mother as they ate supper one night on the terrace of their flat. Some Israeli soldiers threw open the doors of their truck as they drove past and opened fire on them with no provocation, shot through the heart. Now, years later, coming to this unfinished fragment among your papers, your memory threads itself again through the circumstances of its first writing, and you sense you've only written part of the argument, for since then you've seen too many snub-nosed looks in which you were nothing or less than nothing or criminal by your very existence, just fodder for extermination. Maybe there is no 
nor will there be any real answer to this plaguing question, perhaps after we have extincted all the animals on this earth, we will finally turn on each other in some last conflagration like vast armies of rats squealing and biting, ripping each other apart and exterminate one another. And our brief experiment on this, our home planet, will have come to an end. That's pretty uh, deep and powerful, Chuck. You had one that you would like to share from, yeah, from Shanghai? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me find that one. You uh, taught in Shanghai, and you were talking about uh, teaching there, and you had a background. Um, pot, the people that were pretty snobby. Yeah, yeah. See, I had been teaching in Tianjin and had come to the end of my contract, so I got another job in Tianjin, but all of a sudden the school in Shanghai, some hotshot high elite school, contacted me and said, hey, you want to teach at our school? So I thought, all right, I'll just see how these hotshot schools work, see. And I saw, all right, these people were cold, mechanical, unfeeling, uh, the city, the college, everyone, the students. Uh, there, there was even another college there. They said was, that it was even worse. The students wouldn't talk to you at all. I forget, Hudan University or something like that. Anyhow, uh, it, it was a pretty strange place. So, so there you had all these feelings of loneliness and uh, alienation. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the poem I wrote about it. Shanghai in strange countries not excluding your own. Now, at, at the end of the poem, I'm quoting this fin de siècle Norwegian writer, see, Sigbjorn Absfelter, and and. He, he lived in Norway in the 1890s, see. Uh, but, but he had one famous line that, that, that they used to teach all the Norwegian students. So, so you'll see his famous line, see. And somebody said about him when he died, Sigbjorn Absfelter, quote, who walks so quietly in life one can't hear that he has died. So he must be have been very quiet. Hmm. All right. Hmm. Standing back and waiting while the copy machine spits and shudders, stalling for a moment as though stopping to think. Of whom? Us? And then resuming as though reluctantly, the office workers pass to and fro, talking their inbred chatter but of course not to you, suddenly it becomes clear after months of dealing with this crew and their overlords, the sense you have of it is that either you are dead and they are alive, otherwise perhaps you are alive and they are dead, one or the other, or could there be some other arrangement? You feel like some monstrous Quasimodo Stravagon convict sent into ever further exile and even more remote banishment. And you think of the fin de siècle Norwegian writer Sigbjorn Absfelter, who, more than a century of endings ago, every Norwegian now knows to have said, Jag er vist komet pa en fil kloda. I must have come to the wrong planet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way I felt when I came to Shanghai. I must have come to the wrong planet. <laughs> oh, man, you mentioned uh, 
some like the Shanghai girls and then some girl from Hunan wasn't accepted. No, no. She told me uh, the Shanghai girls in her dormitory wouldn't talk to her because she wasn't from Shanghai. You know, so you could imagine how she felt, the girls not talking to her. And you thought, what a bunch of snotty bitches. You know? mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, the there's no wiggle room in China, at least here. And, and, this, and it, um, some girl at chemistry, she grabbed, but she didn't. Oh, yeah. That, that was when I was teaching up north in the, uh, it was called Hebei Gangye Dashwei, Hebei Technological University. And there, when, when it's not going well for you and you decide to do yourself in, you jump off one of the tall buildings at the university. So you can imagine what that's like. So I've got a whole poem uh, about this girl jumping off the 13th floor of the building next to mine. And, uh, and so it's, it's pretty weird. And, right. and see, no, no one ever hears about it. It doesn't show up in the New York Times, the China right. Daily. The school hushes it up. That's the part. That's the part, see. They hush it up. They hush it up. There's, uh, the poem is not in this particular book here. Yeah, it is. It's oh, a, okay. It's we'll give book. you a little chance to uh, yeah. find it. Right. Here's, here's one I was going to read. Okay. I think, I think this one is sort of more universal. Uh, and it's titled, We Have Tried to Live All These Years. But in the end, we are tired, worn out. We haven't managed to live as we would have liked. It seems there is a wall everywhere, among human beings, around countries. Always this wall, and we cannot get through it. It is composed of nearly everything. The others, ourselves, poverty, rich people, the police, the law, the army, murder, violence, lack of love. We will live approaching the end, beating on this wall. Many will grow angry because of our beating on this wall. But that is only another length of the wall itself. In the end, tired, very tired. I get out of bed to write this. Look around, exhausted, Perhaps, despite all this, we have achieved some lucidity, but it doesn't seem worth so much, although perhaps we don't suffer as much as when we didn't understand how this wall would make everything impenetrable and impossible. But your friend seriously says, you're lucky. Be glad you didn't have a teenage son. His grave countenance the haggard worry on his face, this too twines itself into the story. We have tried to live, but tired, tired. Tomorrow, though, we will be forced to have another run at the wall. Sometimes even the wall relaxes, as if to say, yes, yes, for a few hours I'll be a semi-permeable membrane. Take a little holiday. But then, the next morning, like everyone and everything else, it's got to be a serious, impenetrable wall again. So, I, I like that one because it expresses how, how everyone has to live, always trying to get through that wall, and you can never get through it because there are a thousand things stopping you. And why is this wall created between living beings? It doesn't make any sense, but that's how it is. Um, you mentioned uh, Egal. Was Egal, did, was he, uh, did he teach with you there? Was... No, he was actually a guy I met in the uh, international workshop here in the middle 90s. And uh, I think he was an Israeli journalist, and I only knew him for a couple of months. We hit it off, and then the uh, 
period for those international writers was over, and he went back to Israel, and I never saw him again. Was that here in Iowa City? It was, it was here in Iowa City, yeah. Um, then you had, somebody was teaching you something, or you were doing some class, I don't remember, around that time in the 90s, a girlfriend of yours or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, w I was taking uh, uh, a literature class from the English department, and we were studying 19th century uh, writers, American writers, you know. So, so I ended up doing my paper on this Mexican bandit, Joaquin Murrieta, see. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was very interesting because a Cherokee writer, Yellowbird, had written this book about the Mexican bandit, see, but it wasn't any good. And so that was the funny thing about it. And, and all the literati said, oh, yes, this was the first Native American novel. Well, it may have been the first one, but it was no damn good, see. <laughs> <laughs> and you, were, you were, had the spot to say so. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I did all this research, read all these obscure books to show how he was a murderer and cold-hearted. And plus that, he was a racist and would kill the Chinese without thinking twice about it, see. So... Uh, Put him in time and place. In Southern California? Uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, all, all over California and in the Sonora Desert. He was from Sonora. Okay, see, yeah. In Mexico. And somehow, just by accident, you happened to be uh, at our sister's place upstairs, uh, Uptown Bills, last night, and some buddy from California was coming in. Right, right. And, and the guy was really a good blues musician, and he was from Fresno, see, and, and I, I mentioned, you know, uh, the Armenian writer, you know, uh, Saroyan, yeah. and, uh, and Joaquin Marietta. He says, oh, we've got statues of both of those people in Fresno, see, and so I told him about uh, the book, you know, and the approach I took and the conclusion I came to, but it turned out I offended him because he was from the Barrio mm. in, in uh, Fresno, see. And, and to them, Joaquin Murrieta is a Robin Hood figure. See? Oh, okay. So, so that was interesting and, and <clears throat> gave me another uh, thread of this story, see. Mm -hmm. Because I had been out in that area one yeah, time yeah. And, and had gone to Joaquin Murrieta's hideout yeah. had gone to the town which was closest to it and gotten some books on him from the historical society had gone to the city library found another book see so uh, so so then i i gave the book back to the library and the librarian said to me oh you know uh, if if you like this book she said in just about every city library in the state of California, there'll probably be a different book on Joaquin Marietta because he and his criminal gang r ranged over the whole state. Oh. And so I thought, ah, here I thought I, I had understood who he was. No, because a hundred different threads came out yeah. from, from whoever he was. Yeah. And, and made up all these stories, <coughs> uh -huh. and I'll never get to the bottom of it. Ah. <laughs> Plus yeah. that, for saying the book was no good, I got into a lot of trouble in that class oh. with the English department. So oh. It was like you had committed some sort of crime ah. for, for expressing that point of view. See? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so that was... Uh, you had a moment there, a little friction upstairs, but so then you had the writer's workshop a little bit. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I thought it was interesting. You mentioned you had traveled down I-5 south by southwest, and I thought, what a marvelous title for this whole gathering tonight. We just call it South by Southwest, Chuck Miller's take on the planet. You see, I, I just like the twist of it. I think it's good. So that story is rich because it takes all these different elements in there. Um, so like, um, 
Is there any others you'd like to share? Because um, I have a few myself that... All right, which one do you want to talk about? Um, the, first of all, people, um, Chuck has got 100 and I think uh, 167 poems. This is the uh, major work here in his book, Parsecs to Go, Poems of Protest, just published. Um, this is a major work. Um, I'll let Chuck talk about it more, but there are three books in one here, plus an extensive interview. So this is a, a major literary work here, and that's why we want to cover this quite a bit. Um, the one is, um, there's one in here on page, um, Testimony, 157. Um, testimony, 157. I think everyone can understand this. And it, yeah, it, I, th I think this poem, uh, Testimony, is one of the best ones in the book. Uh, and, and everybody can, can identify with it because it's about living in a flat and, and your neighbors are making so much trouble on, on their side of the wall, see, that you overhear The them. wall. The, right. And, of course, what you hear is their bitter arguments, their threats, their violence. So, so that's what this is about. Testimony. For the last year, you've heard them late at night shouting, threatening, excoriating each other, arguing bitterly. You hear one of them thumped against the wall, clunk, because they're in the adjacent apartment, though. The words are muffled, indistinct. Sometimes children are involved. It always evokes a deep and old fear in you of when you were a child and you heard your parents fighting. The meaning of your neighbor's disputes is never clear, yet it almost seems not to matter. It seems in some way like testimony they're giving about this life. The accusations, recriminations, the pathetic weeping between the aggressive sorties, the lawyerly summing up at the top of their voices, the inner district attorney. They don't seem to care about their neighbors, about waking them in the small hours, they're compelled beyond all restraint. You hear the bitterness enter their flesh, the hatred penetrate their hearts. Each time it's the same. Each time the fear and horror of it enters into you. You wonder if a bullet will come through the wall or you'll hear the woman's death agonies as a knife cuts her open multiple times. It occurs to ask yourself if you've ever acted in such a way. No doubt, but years ago when you were younger and were desperate to live and make some small exploding sense of things, now you would walk away. In a few months you'll move, but it's always a gigantic pain in the ass to find another place to live and afford the rent and having to sign another lease like a stone around your neck, the landlord some cunning Scrooge. But these are your fellow human beings registering their deep distress. If you tried to stop them, though, or complain about the disturbances, they might turn on you, scowling contemptuously as though you were some lame who couldn't understand the beautiful and symmetric depth of this orgiastic retribution and threaten to assault you instead of each other. Maybe after hearing them so many times, you almost begin to get used to it, but no, you never get used to it. It enters into you too deeply. It almost becomes a kind of mute language of what we must endure in this wasted life, some strange testimony that everyone is betrayed in a terrible rending. But dawn finally comes like a kind of gray opening, and even future homicides must get some sleep. 
After some days, the police come and show you a picture of what must be the man, but you've never seen, but you've seen him so few times that you don't recognize him. He must have absconded and taken it on the lamb. You never see the woman anymore. The shades are always drawn, <coughs> and there is a noticeable silence to the place. Only the little girl puttering around outside. The woman must go to the supermarket in the middle of the night. You imagine her lying up in her crib, staring into the dark, having had enough of our human life. What a ma powerful insight in many levels. Um, I mentioned... Uh, Mention the wall, yeah, and um, a different version, I think, in a way, um, but a, a psychological but artistic many levels of uh, perception perce penetrating that wall. Um, and just to me, in the winter we've been having, Chuck, in the next page is in these wintry climbs. It seems to me it's related somehow. All right, now this is sort of about. This guy that I knew uh, in uh, southern Illinois and Arkansas, and uh, he was the best writer I had ever met. And, and uh, when I looked at his work, you, you understood that immediately, and all the writers I met afterwards and all the ones I had met before him, they weren't as good as he was. He would, he would decide to write a novel, and on Monday he would he would eat a bunch of coffee grounds uh, at two or three in the afternoon, and and start to get going on his old typewriter. See, mm. and then he'd write till three or four in the morning, and steady steadily like Kerouac uh, when Kerouac wrote. Uh, uh, on the, the road. The subterraneans. See, oh, the subterraneans. When he wrote the subterraneans in three days, see. Then the next day, he'd eat some more coffee grounds, two or three in the afternoon. He'd start off again. All right, so he was doing 50, 60, 70 pages a day. By the end of the week, he'd be done with the novel. No see. kidding. And, and the trouble with, with his work uh, was that he couldn't seem to keep a plot going which made sense. See, it would it would all make sense for two or three pages, then suddenly the plot would veer off into something that really didn't make much sense. So so I said to him, Man, Tim, you've you've got to get this plot to to be coherent, you know. Uh, otherwise all the beautiful pages you write will 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 be uh, fucked off by the editor or the reader and the reader won't get beyond five or ten pages into the book because it just doesn't follow, see. Well, he thought that wasn't important, that what he thought was important was the beauty of it page by page, see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, he mm. was unbelievable. He was a little bit like Janae, mm. if, if you could imagine uh, Janae being American. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And he just, he just died. Mm. A year or two ago. May he rest in peace. Um, does he, is, is this the one? Go ahead, I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. In these <clears throat> wintry climbs, you sometimes lose or misplace your stocking cap, and to keep from getting boxed on the ears by the cold, you wrap your off colored wine scarf around your head, an old babushka then, but with a beard pass perhaps as some shuffling androgynous figure cross-dressing to old man of the mountain. But seeing yourself in a mirror one day, you're reminded of your old friend, the only genius you ever knew with words or paint, who wore as little as possible in the warmer months, in winter would throw on whatever might be at hand, patchwork of pig-slopping coat and shawl, with a moth-eaten sweater 
holy or ripped, would come riding up on his bent and broken surrealist bicycle to share whatever might exist. Sometimes you see down the narrowed tunnel of his gaze to his butchered Van Gogh face, sense that here was a person neither weather nor apparel had any meaning with regard to. What a very fine etching, uh, just a beautiful sculpture, that Van Gogh face. Um, was he this friend in Southern Illinois? Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit more there. Oh yeah, he, he had a, a bad fault. He was also a thief sometimes. So some merchant caught him one night trying to steal something from his store and shot him in the ass uh, with with a shotgun full of buckshot, see. It's so gotta they had, hurt. <laughs> they, they had to take him to the hospital, take out all that buckshot out of his ass, take him to prison and so forth. Um, so this part about the prison part, um, the, 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 I don't know the synchronicity and the humor of uh, Menard and this. Uh, oh, that's right. And the choices he might have had. That's right. See, in Southern Illinois, there was the prison, Menard, uh, and the insane asylum in a town called Anna Jonesboro. See, yeah. so so once he recovered from being shot, they said to him, Tim, we don't know whether to send you to Menard or to Anna Jonesboro. <laughs> and. And like, uh, he had a card, a trump card out of that. A trump card. His mother had been a faculty member, see, so they, they cut him some slack. And finally they said to him, Tim, if you leave the state of Illinois and promise never to come back, we're going to let you go. <laughs> so, so he left Illinois and went back to Arkansas where he grew up, see, and lived the rest of his life in Arkansas. Yeah. That was part of me, it was just the funniness of it. Uh, it's really sad for this dude. That he steals, it's not good, you're not supposed to do that. And then he gets shot in the ass with buckshot. Then, then they take him and arrest his ass. They say, you got two choices here. One is the prison, which is Menards. What is that? Uh, Menards, where you can shop until I don't know what. Um, I think it's funny. Or, or this insane asylum. Um, right, right. Or you're lucky because your mom is... Part of the upper region in yeah. that town, see. So he got a break. He got a break. Um, they cut him a little slack. That's right. That's um, right. And this in, in these wintry climbs, it just seems to me um, so many levels of uh, what we're experiencing right now. That's right. That's right. And you had one, Chuck. I found there was a, actually a couple, but I really like this pacing page 154. It's not too far from um, pacing, 154. Oh, yeah. Um. Now, uh, this, in this one, I'm just pacing back and forth, but it reminds me of when I was in prison uh, for marijuana years ago. And uh, so that's what the poem is about. Pacing. <laughs> Remember years ago when you were in prison, you'd sometimes pace for hours up and down the cell block. At least you'd get out some of that tremendous pent-upness. But you'd also come to understand that you were working on some problem, tramping out your thoughts over this prescribed area as though inscribing your passions in the ground. And by this inscription make known to yourself and the ground the dimensions of your struggle. Now still you find you are set to pacing and hearken back to that most intense wedged-in tramping. Currently your pacing is easier, a little irregular with your bad knee, but with a bit of spring in the legs still and not as desperate the only prison, the world, that expresses its problems through you. But happy, you can still walk. You find it jogs your thoughts more than inscribing them. 
We will pace out the answers yet, walking to the end of the world, to the ultima thule of our questions, wondering. That's a marvelous um, ultima thule. Um, so here, Chuck, you were arrested for uh, marijuana. In the, was that in the 60s? Yeah, that was the late 60s. And that was a terrible bust, man. I tell you, when, you, when, you, when they send you to prison, you don't know how bad it's going to be. Right. And, and at that time, of all times, that should never have been. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it was all a, uh, a kind of put-up job, see, because the, uh, the agent that, that infiltrated our, our group, he was actually a criminal and, and while he was a federal narcotics agent, he was smuggling in heroin through a port in North Carolina, see. And so while I was in prison, my friend uh, sent me a newspaper clipping in which he had been temporarily suspended from the federal force while they investigated his own uh, smuggling activities, see. And then later... I met a prostitute from St. Louis and got to know her a little bit. And she told me that this agent used to go with her pal, also a prostitute, and used to operate out of their apartment, see? Hmm. And she said he'd bust people at the airport, bring the dope over to their apartment, and then get on the phone and call up the dealers in St. Louis and sell them the dope. At a at a cut rate price, see, so so the guy was playing both sides of the street. Was he? Um, was this before the DEH? It was before the uh, DEA, I believe. Nixon came up with that deal. So I know it was about that time, but it was about that time. Yeah, I don't know. Now this dude was d dark, dark, dark narc. He I was mean, a dark character, right? It's something I'm sure nothing good happened to this dude, but in the in the eternal justice of things, we'll put it that way, universally speaking, um, were you in Iowa City then when you were a student here, or um, was this somewhere else that... I was just beginning to go to school here. You were just beginning, so you're like a sophomore or freshman? No, no, I was a graduate student. You were a graduate student, okay. So you must have been in the workshop or close to yeah, it. Yeah, I was in the workshop, yeah. And this is when it happened, when you were in the workshop. Yeah. Wow, man, a great dream and a great freaking nightmare. Yeah. Uh, now, now I've said plenty of nasty things about the workshop, but as, lo as long as we're talking about this instance, uh, the workshop uh, treated me very good when I got busted, see? Yeah. They tried to help me out. They uh, sent me books while I was in prison. They gave me oh, a job for yeah, when I got out. Yeah. So uh, they hadn't turned against me yeah. yet. Yeah. See? Uh, and and so the, they they uh, they were pretty good mm -hmm. uh, with helping out one of their students. Yeah. When they when they turned against me was when uh, this group of writers I was in after I had graduated see, mm -hmm. sort of coalesced. Uh, and and one guy wrote an essay and gave the group a name, see? Right. And then all of a sudden the workshop got really nasty oh. because they didn't like another group of writers to be in Iowa City. It, it was like one of those old westerns where the one guy says, there ain't uh, room enough in this town for both <laughs> you and me, see? <laughs> and I have a feeling this might be the... These really cool writers that I think was uh, Morty Sklar and uh, yeah, yeah. Spirit that Mo the actual right. these That's were right. real deal freaking uh, on the road. Yeah, yeah. They were the spirit of on the road as I see it. Yeah, yeah. The actual and, and these are really great writers. Yeah. So, that was a real real workshop was there. Yeah. And go ahead. Um, this was what sixty eight. No, it was after I graduated in the early 70s, see. And so I continued living here and hung out with these writers and tried now, to survive. At that time, it was still a hippie mecca, Iowa City. Yeah, yeah it was a yeah. way cool place. And 
you know, Black's Gaslight and, you know, P New Pioneer and you name it, Sanctuary and the Mill and on and on and on. These really cool places everybody just went to, rode their bikes, right? Yeah. You know? Then they put that big finger up in the middle of downtown Pedmall called the Sheraton. And they stuck a, a finger in the middle of the Iowa City Peace and Harmony, put that finger in the middle of the sky called the Sheraton, right? Blocked the whole view down there. Yeah. You remember yeah. the Pedmall? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that at that time, the things, uh, the big man with the money, he was starting to roll in and um, suck out the soul of this place. Tried to anyway. You can't ever suck the soul out. But uh, they, these cretins and assholes have really done a fairly good job of uh, concretizing and smashing anything they can find that has peace and love in it. But go ahead. It's your... Um, oh, I, I was remembering... Uh, Let's see, this was after I had gotten out of prison and was finishing up at the workshop. Uh, I think it was 1970, and there were still a lot of demonstrations then. I remember we had been at the demonstration in the day, and then my old girlfriend and I were walking home from a movie that night, and, and we turned the corner there, on uh, Dubuque and uh, Washington and walk south, see, down Dubuque. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, some, some students came running past and they said, run, uh, the pigs are coming and they're taking people out of the bars and beating them, see. Hmm. So, so we ran home as fast as we could and locked the door uh, bec bec because the pigs were just... Uh, beating up whoever they could grab and uh, knocking the shit out of them, see? Wow. So, so another instance uh, where you saw the true nature of the police, see? Mm -hmm. uh, just cruel, nasty, mean, violent, brutal. Right, right. Um, was, that was, there was a lot going on, man. Uh, there was uh, anti-war and just everything, everything was exploding at that time. I mean, freedom of many different kinds, um, especially students. And, you know, there was just a coming out party in a way. And, a, and a, I don't know if you call it Kundalini or something, but something was exploding. Um, and was that that time that Robert Bly quit and uh, Vonnegut was around there then? Um, I think Vonnegut had already left. I I don't think Bly had ever had ever taught here. Oh, uh, he came to read one time, but that's the only time right. I ever saw him. Yeah. Um, do you um, have some of your fellow uh, writers that you hold a good heart to uh, along the road here? Um, talk to you. I, of course, they're in the book here. Invite everybody to get this book. By the way. Um, that's just a question. You don't have to answer it. Um, and these winter climbs. And then there was this one that you uh, had this typewriter. And then the dude uh, went out of business who fixed the typewriter. And I thought that was really, and I know that person, I think. It, oh, do you know? Iowa City. He was down here on South Gilbert. Because I think I got a typewriter from him, too. But there's a wonderful little poem. And... Um, I don't know. It just kind of jumped up. Yeah, what page is it on? Oh, uh, let's, um, I don't know. Um, let's see. Ooh, yeah. Uh, for Jenny, any fake. And, uh, and these oh, ones. yeah, here it is. Real life. The last repair shop for typewriters in the city closed last fall, and you've got to waste time looking for somebody who can still repair your old writer. Finally, you find someone, a good guy who volunteers at the poor people's store. A week later, you pick it up, only $3. You're banging away again on your old manual with your poems and stories, and it feels natural and good. Writer and machine, both antiques now, but still going. Now, to me, that has so much real in it. I mean, like a freaking movie reel. Real. I mean, this is so much more real than the computer uh, board, keyboard. There's, you got human doing the energy push there. 
you're connecting with the mu 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 muscle and mind and heart and yeah, yeah. The typewriter makes it gives it a certain physical coherence. Do you have uh, any your take on all of this techno stuff? As far as uh, has it actually been a any? What do you see there? Is it is it good for the writer? Is it what's going on there? It almost seems as though somehow we've gone past a certain limit. And now so much of what we do is involved in this technical world that we're losing touch with whatever seems to be or whatever might be real in our, in our world still. There's a disconnect. A disconnect, yeah. There's a, you had a poem in there, I wish I could pull it up, but it had to do with that. It was almost like psychic numbing. But there's a different, more eloquent uh, way that it was put, it was having to do with soul, soul destruction or disconnection. But um, <laughs> through the Iowa City Farmers Market, or if anyone you choose would be fine, if you have any that come out to you. All right. Here's one who uh, was for. A Chinese girl I knew in China, uh, it's one of the best poems, I think, in the book, for Lily, feral cat girl. Why not just consider that I have a fatal disease that will sooner than later swamp me under, but which temporarily might be in remission, more or less, could be, though, undermining, so to say, day by day, as I continue to move forward, stumbling a bit, only a little shakier than before. And might not it give me a little tragic aura instead of the merely worn out and shabby of dubious validity, of course. So there might be a space where we could live and love like a kind of unsuspected and hidden plateau. For in this world, most things might not even exist, at least for us, much less have duration. Construe surprise and gratitude for the possible existence of these esteemed and talked of feelings. Could it be? And so we really live now in a kind of non-durative and discontinuous present, like a tense always threatening to give way and disintegrate, still allowing us, though, our most intense grappling with time and existence. And my disease isn't communicable. You can't contract it from me, only vicariously experience side effects of disillusionment and heartbreak. Years later, however, if something else hasn't done you in, and long after I have disappeared, only then will this same malady begin to stalk you, slowly and inevitably from the foothills of your own life, your own experience and substance will it rise up in you. Then you might have a moment of clarity, a casting back to laugh a bit and weep as well remembering how we contrived to cheat fate and live out our interlude together as though it had been some ersatz eternity. Quite beautiful. Um, yeah, that's, thank you, that's beautiful. I'll, I'll tell you the story of how I met this girl. I'd just been at this last school that I taught in in China for a week I was going back to the uh, apartment building where I lived on the campus. See, it was like a dormitory. And here was some girl standing in front of the dormitory crying. So I walked up to her and I said, what's the matter? She said, oh, I'm a new student here. I don't know anyone and I miss my mother. Uh -huh. So I said, I'll be your mother. Come on. Oh, oh sweet. <laughs> And that's how we met. Oh, 
Oh, that's very sweet. Um, and the, the weird thing is, we never did become lovers, although we should have. Yeah. Uh, but for a year, we were each other's best friends, see. And, uh, and she was something else. She had taught herself English starting in the fourth grade. Oh. And so she was the best English student I ever had in oh. China. And, she, and at the age of 19, she was already writing little essays to herself in English. Wow. And so yeah. to me, she was almost like Rimbaud, you know, who gave up poetry at 19. Wow. Uh, she, she was so good. I, I, I thought she maybe had some fantastic sense of things, but within a year, it had all sort of been destroyed, fell apart. But there was that year. There was that year, yeah. I mean, there's, that's a transcendental, uh, yeah. a, a little love going around there, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, anyone else that you would like to? Uh, there's. Um... Okay. Now, now this other uh, girl that I loved, uh, Ruth was her name. And, and, you know, the Chinese girls had their own Chinese names, but for some reason they wanted English names too. Yeah. See? So she, she said to me, well, I don't have an English name. Why don't you give me one? So she was such a kind girl, I called her Ruth. Uh -huh. and, and so in a way, this is for her, and this is the, the one poem she liked the best. Zai Jian, it means goodbye. In Chinese, let us say goodbye, let us say farewell, with only a hint from the corner of our eye, a joke that touches on it briefly, with an embrace that allows us to remain mute, for to actually say goodbye would be far too painful. No, it would entail too much we weeping by far. The enormity of these goodbyes would overwhelm us. If we are to go on, we, ha we cannot heed the cry in our hearts. Or no. Um, yeah, on that note, for now, there'll be a next time. Oh, we've gone through you, an hour. We, we probably have time for one more because we have, right. we, we have about five. And it, whatever, you, but that's such a beautiful poem. Um, All right. Now, here, I've, I've got one here. Now, this is probably the most complicated poem in the whole book and maybe the best. And I, I got it from a quote by Camus, you know, the French writer. Quote, any fate can be overcome through scorn, Camus. Trouble is, one of us said, it's hard to work up that much scorn. I mean, he is talking about a tremendous amount. But of course, you felt enough of it already to give you a head start, so maybe you could summon up, summon up enough to count. Yeah, it would probably eat away at a person who was feeling it like some intense inner acid. Something like bitterness, which, as you know, eats you alive. But there is some difference between bitterness and scorn. What would you say? Scorn is more focused, like a kind of laser light. But now scorn involves both anger and disgust. But isn't there a certain kind of hatred that comes before even the anger? The worst kind. So there is a better kind then that comes out of anger and is more justified and has something of a real reason to exist. If you hadn't felt that much bitterness, you wouldn't really understand what most people in this world have to feel. You'd be less than the one-eyed king in the country of the blind. The fact that so many people feel cheated, robbed, excluded, betrayed, rejected, shat upon, you would have missed out on one of the major human experiences. <coughs> That's true, 
but have you ever met some really poor person and, you know, more or less very unfortunate as well, other maladies, losses, tragedies, and they don't feel much bitterness at all, and yet they seem <coughs> lucid, perceptive, clear somehow? I know what you mean. As though the bitter person had presumed something about life, some sense of justice that hadn't been borne out, and yet this other person presumed nothing at all and was the better off for it. But for you, of course, your bitterness informs your whole life, and mightn't it just as well? Maybe at the end you'd feel your fate right there with you. Would you feel that overcoming of all the absurdities and the rottenness through scorning, or would you rather be appreciating whatever good there had been with some final feeling of acceptance. My guess is that maybe it would only come to you close to the end, which way it would fall, the choice aspect suddenly gone out of it, and it would be one or the other, the feeling would make itself known, and perhaps that's what you'd go out on. Could there be some combination of the two? Maybe but somehow it seems dubious. Perhaps fate is so absurd that you might just as well scorn it all and be done with it once and for all. But how would that be done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Chuck. Yeah, I appreciate it, and um, there'll be another time here. Thank you for such a rich sharing. All right. Get this book, people, Parsecs to Go, Poems of Protest. Thanks for the uh, Sarah Tate in the studio control here and Josh Gooding um, as we're going to send this around the planet and uh, let this be shared in China, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>